Okay, so hello everyone. I really hope you guys had your first test as a very good one. And uh, today we are going to discuss the first 25 questions of our test number one. So this is your PMF IS Current Affair Prelims Test Series and my name is Ashish Malik. And I'm the one doing all the analysis. I'm the one going to discuss all the questions with you. So uh, in one particular video, there would be discussion of 25 questions. Okay, so for test number one, will be having four different different parts. So every part would be having 25 question each. So let's see uh, how was your test and uh, I'm sure in this particular discussion video, we are not just going to tell you the answers, but the whole purpose of this discussion is to make you learn more. If you are preparing for your upcoming exam and if you have not yet covered the syllabus completely, then still this test series is a chance for you where you can learn a lot in a reverse order. I mean, by attempting the questions, you can still learn a lot of new things. And that is the sole purpose of this discussion video. Let's get started. Let's see how was your questions and how you guys have attempted. So the very first question of today's test was about the primary agriculture credit societies. Now, this is a very important question because when it comes to the cooperative societies, when it comes to the Indian banking system, so under the cooperative societies, these primary agriculture credit societies are very, very important topic. And you were supposed to tell how many of the statements were correct. Okay. Now be very, very, very careful in your exam. If the question is asking about correct or incorrect, many times they switch the statements. So always make sure you first of all figure out if they are asking you the correct one or the incorrect one. And now it is saying how many statements are correct. You, you know, before 2023 prelims, usually uh, what UPSC used to ask you which statement is correct but now they're not asking which statement is correct they're asking how many statements are correct so of course these are these uh, kind of questions are a bit more difficult because you have to have 100% accuracy you can't go with the elimination method so always try to read the statements very very carefully and take your time understand them well and then only attempt the question now the very first question uh, the very first statement was about the pack that the, these agriculture societies are registered under the Cooperative Society Act. That is absolutely correct. They are registered under the Cooperative Society Act. And the second part says that they are regulated by the state government only. Now, there is some problem with this statement only. See, they are uh, registered under Cooperative Society. So, by default, state government has a regulatory control over them, right? But it is not the only state government that has a control. Even Reserve Bank of India has its own regulation over these cooperate, these uh, uh, credit societies. So there is a dual control. You, can, you see there is a dual control over these societies. The state government as, be, as well as the RBI has its own control. And our RBI controls through many acts that I will discuss a little later. So the first statement is not correct. Second statement says that they are constituted the, at the lowest tier of the short term cooperative credit yes they are they are the lowest tier because they are the lowest tier because you see uh, out of all these so initially you have the you have the state ones then you have the district ones and then finally at the lowest level lower level as in at the gram level or you can say at the village level right so they are constituted as the lowest lowest tier of these cooperative credits because they they have to deal directly with the farmers all the beneficiaries, they directly deal with the beneficiaries and individual farmers are the members also. Yes. So this is the beauty of a, a credit society since they are cooperative society. No, in cooperative society, the farmers here, they are also the consumers. They are also the consumer, the beneficiaries and they are also the members. So farmers are having a dual role in these uh, credit societies because that is how the cooperative uh, structure works in cooperatives the members are also the uh, the users and also the beneficiaries and they are also the contributors that's how the credit society works so second statement is absolutely correct there is no problem with that individual farmers are the members also they are the beneficiaries also and third statement says the NABARD NABARD is a very important uh, organization for agriculture in India so it says National Bank for Agricultural and Rural Development, NABARD, refinances these pack through the district 
central cooperative banks yes and the state cooperative banks so third statement is also absolutely correct though so only problem was with the first statement hence the answer is supposed to be only two so the answer is b for the question number one now to give you a bit more information about these uh, how these regulatory bodies work and i told you that these uh, packs are under the dual control so state government has a control but now when i told you that reserve bank also controls and regulates these societies so rbi is regulating these pack under these two particular regulations these two particular acts so one is banking regulation act other is banking laws cooperative societies act i mean you may not be asked directly but at least you should have these two uh, banking acts in mind in terms of reserve bank of india these two are very very important uh, regulatory uh, laws that rbi uses and most of the banking system is controlled by using these kind of acts so at least have a uh, have an idea in mind which which kind of acts are being used now also to give you the uh, understanding of how the structure of the the primary credit uh, secure uh, these societies work like i told you guys that it's a three tier system and you can see here so that's the whole banking system of india and you have the commercial banks regional rural banks which is also called the rrbs and here we have the cooperative banks right now under the cooperative we have the state cooperative the central cooperative and then here is where we have the primary credit societies and that's why they are considered to be the lowest in the credit link that's why they are dealing at a grassroots level which is the village level okay now the second question was a very straightforward question it was it was just a factual one so you are supposed to tell that which of the following is responsible for uh, preparing the export preparedness index in india which is epi so which of the following releases the export preparedness index it has to be niti ayog and niti ayog uh, prepare and publishes these export preparedness index and they do it on the annual basis okay so on annual basis uh they are the one responsible for publishing the export preparedness index now what exactly this index is all about that also you need to understand so basically what happens export is something which which is one of the key elements of our macroeconomic policies right i mean which particular state is good uh, at exporting where is the export potential because ultimately india wants to be export surplus country and export is something which is very very crucial for for indian economy and to understand to uh, to get the right picture of the exports niti ayog which stands for national institute for transformation of india ayog so this niti ayog on annual basis releases this index and it is prepared sector specific wise and district level wise trends are captured so sector specific like which particular sector of the economy is it the primary sector which is you know having a good potential or the secondary sector or the tertiary that way it is prepared and it is also prepared on a district level trend basis and uh, there we get to know a real picture that which particular indian state or which union territory of india what kind of export potential we can have so that we can plan our exports accordingly and we can enhance our performance okay now while preparing this particular uh, index niti ayog utilizes four frameworks or you can say indicators so whenever the preparedness index is uh, is compiled there are four important factors that are taken into consideration so one is the policy the business ecosystem export ecosystem and export performances you please note down it is the business ecosystem which has the highest weightage which is 40% weight weightage is given to this particular parameter okay now you may have in your upsc you may have this question where the question is about export preparedness index and they may ask you based on which particular indicators this index is being prepared so at least you should have the idea there are four indicators with business ecosystem having the maximum weightage maximum percentage and it has its own breakdown like how favorable environment is there in that particular state what kind of infrastructure is available because exports uh, need a specific kind of infrastructure right you need to have a port facility you need to have a storage facility you need to have a packaging facility so these kind of infrastructure is required and very importantly the transport the connectivity because the better connectivity you have you always have a better chance of exporting the the systems right 
and uh, so these are basically uh, uh, the things later you can read from the PDF you can read about the detail of each but at least try to have the idea the indicators in mind and which is having what kind of percentage that is important guys the third question was a match of the following kind, uh, type of question in this question number four so you were given four kind of traditional toys let me let me tell you one thing here uh, toys industry is something which is very very booming in India why this particular question is being asked because in India we have seen in the last three to four years there has been a massive decline in the import of the toys India used to import toys a lot but now in the last from the last three four years drastic decline in the import India is rather manufacturing its own toys and we are also raising the bar by exporting more and more toys so India is kind of on a trajectory to become self-reliant in terms of toys industry and this has happened after the Pradhan Mantri Narendra Modi has emphasized on the toys industry very specifically and a great push was given to the toys manufacturing as well as exports now now we have the four traditional toys in India and you were supposed to tell me which state they belong now this is a very very common kind of question which UPSC ask where they ask you something special uh, something specific about a state and you are supposed to figure out if the state matches is correct or not so the first was about the Kondapalli Kondapalli traditional toys belongs to Andhra yes they belong to Andhra Pradesh the second was the Kanya, Kanya Putri dolls when Kanya Putri dolls do not belong to Assam they actually be, belong to Bihar I'll show you a map don't worry I'll show you a map of the entire traditional toys that you can remember you can revise later on so second is absolutely wrong then we have the the Bahat Kutli Bahat Kutli is uh, something belongs to Maharashtra yes that is also correct now third the fourth one is also wrong now this this particular toy which is called the Ashari Kandi Terracotta it does not belong to Bihar this is the one that actually belongs to Assam okay so there, there is nothing uh, uh, there is no logic behind it it's just a fact based question you should know and that's why I'm saying do read about the traditional toys of India because this is a very hot topic these days and UPSC might ask you these kind of questions because ultimately the toy industry of India is booming so two pairs are correct the answer has to be B question number three has to have the answer as B uh, two are correct two are not correct and you can have a look at this particular number I was talking about so India's toy import has decreased by 70 percent and our exports has actually grown by 61 that's why in fact a few days back uh, I think last week there was a uh, uh, there was an editorial in the Hindu newspaper also which was talking about the booming toy industry of India so do check out this particular editorial and read about the toys industry of India India is extremely performing well in terms of traditional toys and here is the map guys later on you can check out these traditional toys all the major all the important ones are given in the PDF where every state has their own kind of toys okay so that you can check out it's, there is a map you, uh, that uh, PDF you can download and you can study these toys now we have the question number four now this question is something which is now this particular pattern of the question is very important if you if you will see the question paper of 2023 UPSC prelims this is something which was very common where you are given two statements and you have to you have certain combinations in the options okay so very very careful you have to read so please before I before I go to the statements please understand the pattern of the question the combination says that first and statement both are correct but and the second statement correctly explain the first one that is option one option two will have the both statements are correct but two is not not explaining the first one correctly and third is the statement one being correct two being incorrect and fourth says statement one was incorrect and the statement two correct so please read I request you guys to have a familiarity by reading these kind of statements normally we are not used to these kind of questions but UPSC is asking this combination so have a try to read it very very careful very carefully first read the options now coming to the question the question was about the swift now swift is very very important topic from the last two years especially after Russia Ukraine war I'll tell you why it is so important so swift first of all the, the full form of swift swift stands for 
सोसाइटी फॉर द वर्ल्ड वाइड इंटर बैंक फाइनेंशियल टेली कम्युनिकेशन दैट इज द फुल फॉर्म आई एक्सपेक्ट यू गाइज एटलीस्ट यू ट्राई टू रिमेंबर बिकॉज द क्वेश्चन हैज इट्स आंसर इन द फुल फॉर्म ओनली इट इज अ वर्ल्ड बैंक वर्ल्ड वाइड इंटर बैंक फाइनेंशियल टेली कम्युनिकेशन सो हाफ ऑफ द जॉब इज डन इफ यू अंडरस्टैंड द मीनिंग ऑफ स्विफ्ट तो फर्स्ट स्टेटमेंट से स्विफ्ट प्रोवाइड्स अ सिक्योर फाइनेंशियल कम्युनिकेशन नेटवर्क बिटवीन द बैंक ग्लोबली to avoid fraud fraudulent uh, trans uh, transactions so if you know the uh, the full form so you can say that yes absolutely this statement is correct there is no problem so swift is basically when you have to transfer the money you have to do any transaction at a global level let's say if i have to send money to usa okay or usa has to send money to india so that way we can use the swift system like for example um if if you are having a bank account in let's say punjab national bank if you have to send money to other bank there is a requirement of the ifsc code right in india there is always a requirement of the ifsc code so like ifsc code is for the uh, within pan india transactions similarly for international transactions you need a swift code you need a swift code so swift is basically uh being prepared it is it's a belgium cooperative society it is being prepared to make sure that without any fraudulence or frauds international global transactions can take place in a very secure manner so first statement was absolutely correct but this problem with the second statement why it says second statement says the swift ensure the faster transaction information from one bank to another whether whether both banks are in the same country or not that is fine half statement is right there was a problem with the remaining part of the statement it says swift also perform clearing and settlement function well well this particular thing is not a cup of tea of the swift swift is just a code which will make sure the transactions are happening in a secure safe manner clearing and settlement is not the job of the swift the clearing and settlement has to be done by by the respective payment settlement systems there are there are other different payment systems that is their job to have a final clearing and settlement understood swift is just a gateway it is not their job to do the payment uh, settlement it is their their job is just it's like a transport so from one destination to two it is just the road swift is just the passage which is allowing you to do the transaction that transaction is okay or not or if there is anything else that is not their job that is mainly done by the payment systems that is their job which can clear and finalize the settlements so second statement is not correct here so that's why the option has to be c statement 1 correct and 2 is incorrect i hope that is okay to you i hope you guys have understood it in in a very clear manner so please remember this example of ifsc code and the swift code that way you can relate it better now to give you a bit more information about the swift please remember it is a belgium cooperative society and uh, it is their job where secure financial communication network is being provided now something very important star mark point guys swift does not manage the accounts it is not their job to manage the account or hold the funds it is done by the respective banks swift is just a gateway it is just a transitional medium also it does not perform the clearing settlement uh, functions that like i told you it is done by the different payment systems it is just a unique code which is there to uh, make sure the transaction is happening at a global level now why this was in news swift was in news mainly because after the russia ukraine war a uh, swift system has excluded russia now they had excluded russia from the international transactions and that 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 was a move that was a kind of sanction put by the western countries to isolate isolate the economy of the russia right and that is why it was news uh, from the last 2 years and that's why this question was asked in your test series now the now the fifth question says you have to uh, consider about the digital payments and again you have to figure out how many statements were correct the first statement says the central bank digital currency the cbdc they are digital version of the fiat currency fiat currency is basically the hard currency the hard currency the physical currency that you and me are using the 500 rupees note 100 rupees that is a that is a fiat currency 
So central bank digital currency, digital version of the fiat currency issued and regulated by central bank. Yes, absolutely correct. So uh, basically the central bank digital currency, it was introduced in India as an alternative to private cryptos. This was introduced as a, as a better alternative to the cryptocurrencies. To the cryptocurrencies that we have, we are having like Bitcoin or something because they are decentralized after all, right? Normally cryptocurrencies are decentralized. Decentralized as in there is no central authority governing them and that's why normally cryptos like Bitcoin, Ethereum and all, they are very, very volatile, no? They are very volatile. The prices can go sky high, can drop earth bottom. You can't, you can't uh, do anything about it, right? They are more volatile. They are a bit more risky. And that's why it is the normal decentralized one. Now to, to give uh, the consumers a better, a safer option, if they want to invest in some digital currencies, that's why Indian Reserve Bank of India uh, came up with the central bank digital currency. It's normally a digital version of the fiat currency that you and me are using. Now, please make sure do not get confused with this as a digital wallet. Like you are already having the digital transactions, like you are doing the UPI. You are doing the, the like, for example, Paytm wallets, Bharat Pay wallets, right? The, that is something different. Don't get confused that Paytm wallet or uh, uh, Bharat Pay wallet is same as, di as digital currency. Digital currency is altogether a digital asset. What you are having in UPI and Paytm and Bharat Pay is simply electronic form of your actual money. So UPI, Bharat Pay, uh, Google Pay, all these kind of platforms, they are still having, they are still using the fiat currency. It's just the digital representation. Okay, that is a different thing. It is your, your own regular money. Because ultimately, all these uh, UPI apps, Paytm, Bharat Pay, they are ultimately attached to your bank accounts. Na? They are ultimately attached to your bank accounts. And in bank, you have the, the real cash. You, you, you uh, put the real money, real cash. The fiat currency is what you give. Central bank digital currency is an altogether digital product, which is issued and regulated by the central bank. So first statement is correct. I do not see any problem in that. The second statement was about the UPI 123 pay. Now this is very interesting. UPI 123 pay is basically a three step method, which is uh, to initiate execute you services to the users. And uh, it is basically to uh, ease out the payments because UPI 123 is something even without internet, you can use it. This is a particular app. This is a particular platform. Even without internet, even without internet, you can use this platform. So here only fo uh, features, phones, uh, you can do, you can, uh, you can do all transactions by simply basic feature of the phones you can use. And without, and there is, there is, there is no need to scan or pay or something because I told you it, it works without internet also. So to ease out the digital payments to, you know, uh, make the payment system bit more easy for especially those people who are not having the internet connection, UPI has got this UPI one, two, three payment. Okay. So first and second are absolutely correct. No problem with that. The third statement is a bit, which is not correct. Well, the third statement says, the National Payment Corporation of India, which is the NCPI, the National Payment Corporation of India has a limit of 20 transactions per day. Okay, that is fine. 20 transactions is the limit. And it is 10 lakh rupees per day. And this limit was set in 2021. Well, the third statement is not wrong, not correct. I'll tell you why. See, in 2021, especially after post COVID and all, National Payment Corporation of India got to know that there are tremendous, there's large volume of transactions, very, very large volumes of the transactions which are happening by the UPI. Okay. So National Payment Corporation of India taking into account the kind of digital transactions were happening in India, they decided to put a limit, a per day limit and per transaction limit also. And that is why they're at present all this, this is a limit which is also there today. So National Payment Corporation of India says that all the digital payments, there would be 20 transactions per day, that is fine. But the limit is not 10 lakh rupees per day. The limit set is 1 lakh rupees per day. If you, if you have to, you know, send the money in the UPI, 
you also know only 1 lakh rupees you can uh, shift through the UPI in one particular day. One day as in 24 hours. So in the 24 hours, the maximum digital transition that can be done is 1 lakh rupees per day. That is the limit. It is not the 10 lakh rupees. It is the 1 lakh rupees. It is for the normal consumer for normal transactions. Of course, there are some exceptions. So I'll tell you those exceptions. But first, please note down the question. First, second, correct. Third, not correct. So how many statements are correct? Only two. The answer has to be B. Now, I hope you got why this particular uh, third statement is wrong. And there are some exceptions also. Normal transaction limit is 1 lakh rupees per day. Now, there are some specific categories where you have this limit a bit more. Like for example, if you are doing transactions in the capital market or you are, you are going to do the transactions for some invert remittances or like that, then you have a maximum limit of the 2 lakh. Okay. Or again, if you are, if you are uh, talking about the limit which is, which is a UPI based ASBA, which is application supported by block amount payment. If you are basically investing in the IPO, IPO is initial public offering. IPO is the initial public offering. If you are, if you are investing in those kind of stuff in initial public offering, initial public offering is where, when a startup goes public, if there is any startup, if there is any startup now after three, four, five years, if it is going public for the first time means it is selling its share first time in the market. If it is first time diluting its equity, it's first time selling its stocks in the market. And that is first time they are doing it. That is called the IPO, initial public offering. IPOs are done in the primary market of economy. It is done in the primary market of the economy. Okay. In that particular case, the maximum limit is 5 lakh rupees, but there is absolutely nowhere the limit is 10 lakh rupees. I hope you got the, under, got the point. So normally this is the limit for everyone, you and me, some specific categories, but then also the, the limit is not 10 lakh rupees is nowhere the limit. And that is why the third statement was incorrect guys. I hope you got it. You have understood it, understood it well in a very uh, good manner. Okay. Chalo. So now we have the sixth statement. Now sixth page statement was about the strategic petroleum reserves. Now there are there were three questions. There are three statements were given to you, and you were supposed to figure out which of the following is the correct one. Okay. So first statement says that strategic. Uh, this this term is very important. Okay. Strategic petroleum reserve is a topic which you must prepare for your UPSC prelims as well as mains. Because it was in news, at least uh, in the last one or two year, many, many headlines you will find on the strategic petroleum reserves. Now, India has built the strategic petroleum reserves at the three locations called Vishakhapatnam, yes, Mangalore, yes, Padur, yes. Okay, Padur and uh, uh, Mangalore both are in Karnataka. Okay, they both are, they belong to Karnataka. India has given in principle approval for the construction of the additional SPRs at uh, Chandi Khol. Chandi Khol is a place in Odisha, by the way. It's a place in Odisha. Yes, India has also approved in future there would be additional strategic petroleum reserve at Chandi Khol and Padur will also have one more unit. And that is done under the PPP model. Yes, private public private ship model is what we are following here. And third statement says India has agreement with the United States of America to store crude oil in the latest SPRs. Yes, absolutely. So all three statements are absolutely correct. Right answer is D. Now let me give you a bit information about the strategic petroleum reserves. Okay. You need to understand this topic very well. What are SPR and why do we need it? See guys, you know, oil is something India is totally dependent on the import. Like 85% like of the oil is what we import, right? So majority of the crude oil that India depends upon is based on the imports. Now, you know, if you are dependent on the import, there are two drawbacks of importing. Number one, of course, it will hurt your Forex. It will always hurt the foreign exchange reserves because you have to pay. You have to pay the price in dollars. You have to pay the bill in dollars. And number two, the problem is there is a volatile prices. There is always volatile prices. I mean, sometimes the prices of the crude oil are so high, it is very, very costly to import them. Sometimes the prices go very, very down and the whole, uh, you know, market becomes very ease off. 
so uh, like there are so many factors like crude oil prices are not something that india can decide right the crude oil prices dependent are depending on so many global factors the global economy the global demand and supply the production unit the political stability the geographic uh, the geographical issues there are so many other things which ultimately decide the crude oil prices now what happens what happens when the crude oil prices drop globally when you have low crude oil prices low crude oil prices you know you remember uh, there was a time when the crude oil prices actually got so as low as 20 30 dollar per barrel i mean that was a kind of prices uh, uh, like in the last two, two and two and two or three years so when the crude oil prices are at the lowest or are at comparatively lower level what government does government buy that crude oil in excess we always buy those cheap oil in excess and we store that excess oil for the bad days yet to come in future if there is any kind of disruption if there is any kind of shortage in the market or because of any reason if india is not able to import the crude oil for some particular number of days so that the economy does not get st stabilized okay and as of now india though though the standard practice is the the standard operating procedure says that every country should aim for at least 90 days at least 90 days reserves has to be there that is a standard practice but in india's case we are so far what we have done we are able to have a 9.5 days reserve india is now this is the reserve that we have achieved so far so if there is because of any reason we are not in a position to import the crude oil at least these, these many days we can go on without importing so 9.5 days is what we have achieved with these strategic petroleum reserves and we have we have opened them at the three locations two more locations will come up in future and of course this limit will increase the third is absolutely correct the third says there is a india and a usa they have a they have an agreement guys they have this agreement uh, which is called india us strategic energy partnership look this is india us strategic energy partnership that is very important okay and uh, what this agreement says so if let's say india does not have enough infrastructure what india can do india can ask usa that please store the crude oil on my behalf and later when it is required india will get that discounted crude oil from the usa got it so india has this uh, arrangement agreement with usa where india can access and use the stored oil at the usa strategic reserves that is a part of india us strategic energy deal okay that is very very important now for your upsc prelims also do take care of the locations locations are important guys so where we have the strategic reserves at least try to see them at the map also so in Karnataka, here we have the Padur and here we have the Mangalore. Okay, this is Padur, this is Mangalore. And uh, of course, in, in uh, Andhra, we have this, we have the Vishakhapatnam. And in Odisha, we have the Chandi Khol. This is important. Maybe you will have more strategic reserves in future, but this is what we have achieved so far. And the limit that we have gained, the kind of reserves we have is 9.5 days reserves. That's are what we have with India. Now the next question, number question number seven is what we are targeting for. Question number seven says, which of the following is correct with respect to the above statements? And the statement number one says, again the same pattern, okay? Be careful. Uh, I'm not going to repeat the pattern, but at least you should be careful about statement one, statement two. Statement one says, inflation causes decline in purchasing power of the money and erodes the real value of the saving. Absolutely correct. What is inflation? Inflation is the constant increase in the prices. And when the constant prices increase, let's say if I used to buy a cup, there was a there was an ice cream, and this ice cream I used to buy like there was a time when in ten rupees I used to get two ice creams, let's say, and now I am able to buy only one ice cream in the ten rupees means inflation, inflation has gone up. There was a five rupee ice cream now it has become ten rupee ice cream, right? So earlier I used to buy two ice cream in ten rupees now I am able to buy only one. So what is happening? My purchasing power is getting declined. No, my purchasing power has declined because inflation always raises the prices and in the same amount of money, we are able to 
purchase less and that is why it says it erodes the real value of the savings because inflation always hurt the savings in the most negative manner first statement is correct second statement says inflation is sustained increase in general price level uh, of uh, goods and services in economy over a period of time yes absolutely both are correct and the second statement is very well explaining the first one that is a very easy question so answer has to be a and i already told you what is the relation between inflation and the purchasing power right it is important so try to understand the basics of the inflation inflation in hindi we call it mehangai right so inflation is a, a kind of a process it's a kind of a phenomena where there is a constant rise in the prices so 10 rupee item will become 15 rupee 15 rupee item will become 20 rupees so there is a constant increase in the prices and that's why the savings and the purchasing power reduces okay uh, okay so next question now next question is also somewhat about the inflation and there is a very different term very interesting term called as greedflation i am sure you must have heard the term greedflation inflation is a very common term but read the question carefully question says which of the following is correct about inflation and greedflation now the first statement says inflation is sustained increase in general prices that is okay correct greedflation is a situation where the corporate greed drives inflation by raising prices excessively to maximize the profit now that is the right one guys i'll tell you what the greed inflation inflation you guys know inflation you have already uh, read about now, what is greed inflation now greed inflation is a very very negative phenomena it's a bad phenomena what is greed inflation basically some corporate some private companies some corporate houses you know they deliberately increase the prices of the items they deliberately they increase the price of their items deliberately raising the price because there is already inflation and already in the inflating economy they are raising their prices more and more the only aim is to maximize their profits they are that actually hurts economy more because let's say for example uh, let's say um what should i say okay now there is any any uh, uh, um okay so let's say let's say there was a time of uh, covid okay let's say there was a time of covid now in the covid times let's say so the people they were uh, they were manufacturing say sanitizers okay so sanitizers were being made in india now normally let's say sanitizer cost rupees 30 okay and during the covid because of the economic slowdown everything was already inflating there was inflation inflation was already high now those sanitizer makers deliberately deliberately increase the price of sanitizer from 30 to let's say 100 rupees this is just an example not a very accurate one but just to make you understand so during the times of inflation certain corporate houses deliberately increase the prices of their products because people will anyway buy them because it is already inflation people do not question normally when do the prices increase see the prices always increase uh, because of the of the two things there is normal price rise because of demand and supply there is a process of demand and supply if there is if there is more demand and the supply is less the prices will increase okay nor this is the normal scenario or or if the demand if there is already demand supply reduces because of any factor then also prices increase but but in the greed inflation the price the prices are not increasing because of demand supply mismatch the prices are increased deliberately by those corporate houses the only aim is that they want to maximize their profit i hope that is that makes sense so first statement absolutely correct now what was wrong with other statements let's try to understand the other statement as well what was wrong with them so second statement says the first is okay fine second says inflation measured by wpi and uh, cpi that is okay greed inflation no there is no such there is no such measure greed inflation is not measured as such there is no phenomena there is no method by which greed inflation is measured and by the way these uh, producer price index and gdp deflators they are used to measure the inflation only there is no index no method or no formula to measure the greed inflation 
Inflation. Now, so that's why second is incorrect. Third says inflation caused by demand pull factor, cost push factors. Fine. That's what that's what I was telling you. Demand pull factor is when demand is more than the supply. Cost push factor when the supply get reduced and demand is high, then it is the cost push factors. And greedflation caused by st structural bottlenecks. No, absolutely not. Greedflation has nothing to do with the policies of the government. It is only the corporate houses that increases their prices. Inflation, positive phenomena, greedflation, negative phenomena. Uh, inflation is also not that positive phenomena, right? Inflation can be positive, can be negative, depending on which section you are talking about. Inflation hurt different people differently. The uh, like, for example, uh, for example, the producers. The producers always gain. They always gain when there is a inflation. The consumer always lose. Consumers always lose when there there is inflation. Similarly, the uh, the the money lenders. The lenders always lose whenever there is inflation. And uh, the borrowers always gain when there is a inflation. So definitely, it, it is not easy to say that inflation is positive. It depends uh, on different different sections because inflation hurt economies or hurt the sections in a very different manner. Okay. Okay. And yeah, one more thing. One more thing that you should uh, that you should be looking here. Greedflation. Do take care. Greedflation is the result of the profit price spiral. Like inflation is all because of the wage spiral. So if by chance in your exam you are being asked about it. So which particular which of the following is the result of profit price spiral? It has to be greedflation. Okay. There are many different terms like you should prepare inflation, prepare uh, uh, stagflation. There is a term called stagflation also. Inflation, stagflation. Uh, there are different different terms which are there. So you do prepare all these topics. Okay. Your question number nine was about the WPI and the CPI. Very, very important. The question was about the base year revision of these two indexes. You know, they are very important indexes, guys. In India, the wholesale price index and the, and the consumer price index, both are used to measure the inflation. Number one, be careful. Both are used to measure the inflation in the economy. Now, both these indexes, have their own base year. Base year is a reference year. For example, if I have to tell you that, okay, sir, uh, sir, my income has increased, my salary has increased, my salary has increased by 50%. So 50% from where? There has to be a benchmark, na? So 50%, okay, sir, my salary has increased 50% from what I used to get in 2020, let's say, or what I used to get in 2021. So there has to be a reference point, no? And similarly, whenever you are calculating the inflation, whether it is WPI or CPI, there has to be a reference point from where we are measuring that increase or decrease, whatever. So that reference point in terms of these indexes is what you call as the base year. Okay. Now, considering that into mind, you are supposed to figure out how many statements are correct. So the base year of the WPI was revised. Yes, it was revised. Used to be 2004-5, now it has become 2011-12. Now this is the latest base price. So after the after this uh, Narendra Modi government came into power, so they have revised the WPI. Now what we are using is the 2011-12 year is used as a base year. And every calculation of the inflation is calculated from this reference point. So if, if now we are saying that inflation is 5.6%, so 5.6% from where? 5.6% from this particular point, the reference point is there. And similarly, the CPI was uh, base year was also revised from 10 to 12. So this statement is correct. No problem with the statement. The second statement says the revision of the base year of WPI CPI is done to capture the changes in structure and composition of the economy over time. Yes, absolutely. Why do we change it? Of course, we change it because over a period of time, the consumption pattern changes, guys. The consumption pattern changes. Uh, there are more items which are being added in WPI, CPI, right? So to make, to give, to give more real picture, to give more real picture of the inflation trends, 
to uh, to be to be more inclusive in terms of number of items covered that's why from time to time it is always important to increase the base year now one interesting thi thing let me tell you uh, which year is considered as a base year which uh, which year we generally like how how we choose this year is a good base year so basically uh, uh, to decide an year as a base year that particular has to have a very stable economic conditions i mean there has to be good economic conditions at that particular year there has to be economic stability you know it should not be any volatile year it should it should always be an year where economic stability was there and that's why it is considered as a benchmark like for example tell me uh, would you ever consider 2020 can 2020 ever become a base year answer would be absolutely no because base year because 2020 was the most volatile year because of the covid pandemic there was most volatile right the economy dropped by say 23 percentage in in one particular quarter so never ever so only those year are considered as base year which are which are uh, uh, having good economic stabilities and having good growth rate in that particular year so first and second are correct no problem now read the third and fourth very carefully third statement says revision of the base year of wpi cpi resulted in lower inflation rates for both indexes no this is not correct please understand if you revise the base year it is just to project the more real picture base year base year is only about changing the reference point it is not going to lower the inflation inflation will get lower when there is actual price change no if you have to lower down the inflation it is it is when you will have some actual price change without actual price change the inflation rates are not going to get change guys so changing base year does not mean lower inflation rates so third is not correct the fourth statement says the revision of the base year of wpi cpi increases the weightage of both food item and services in both the indexes now the fourth is also incorrect <clears throat> why it is incorrect please read the statement very careful now first of all wpi is wholesale price index it includes only goods not the services it is the cpi that includes the goods as well as services okay so first of all it says the question says that wpi cpi increase weightage of food item and services so services are not applicable on wpi number 1 number 2 changing the base year does not necessarily change the weightage of the items of course over a period of time wpi we add more items to wholesale price index we add more uh, items to the basket of cpi that is a different thing but by revision of the base year in the the, uh, the items the weightage changes that is not the case that is totally not applicable the two things are not interrelatable right okay and one more thing just to give you an additional information wpi and cpi okay now you must remember the basic difference between the two one difference i told you wpi is only goods cpi is the uh, goods and services now when you talk about the retail inflation in in news you normally get this uh, news of retail inflation so whenever we talk about retail inflation it is only always the cpi is what we are measuring because consumer price index give you the real uh, inflation from a consumer point of view wholesale price index will give you inflation from a producer point of view from the manufacturer point of view and the consumer like people like you and me what we actually face is this kind of inflation the consumer price inflation is what we uh, uh, what we face okay and again just to give you a bit more information and one extra knowledge i would like to add the wholesale price index the wpi it is prepared by dpiit department for promotion of industry and internal trade which operates under ministry of commerce and industry okay and the cpi it is being prepared by ministry of statistics and program implementation you never know you may have a question where the the comparison is may, being made between wpi and cpi that's why just an added added information i uh, i have told you these two extra informations okay i think that that is clear to everyone guys and look at the beautiful uh, do look do look at the beautiful explanation that we have uh, in our pdf uh, uh, you know explanations are very very good 
and also guys just to give you a brief idea and i'm i'm sure you must be wondering you must be wondering why there are uh, uh, so many colors in the pdf well every color has a specific meaning guys all these pink colors all all these uh, purple and pinks actually make you understand the importance of that particular line or particular word if it is brown it is definitely going to be important from your prelims point of view if it is if it is blue it has some other significance right so do do check do take care of the uh, colors they are specially been introduced for your better understanding now question number 10 is about which of the following is not a consequences of the inflation now be very careful the question is asking which of the following is not a consequences now many many students sometimes read the question in a very uh, fast manner they don't take care of which is which is being asked it is correct or the incorrect one now in this statement you have to figure out which which is not a consequence of inflation so what inflation does not do so first statement says increase in saving and investment absolutely not inflation can never increase the saving i told you inflation always erodes the value of the money no it always erodes the value of the money and thus erodes the value of the saving also so people in in times of inflation people's don't generally save because there is already inflation there is already mahangai people don't save people have less money to save the people will have less money to save they are not in they will not be in a position to save more and that's why they are not even able to invest because if there is no saving there won't be any investment so first statement is something which is not a consequence so our answer has to be a 10 a is the right answer rest everything is correct yes inflation redistribute income and wealth that is correct erode the purchasing power i already told you distort the relative prices and output yes absolutely correct but the first statement is not a consequence of the inflation guys next question was about pm mitra scheme question 11 that you are being asked is about pradhan mantri mega integrated textile region and apparel which is called pm mitra for short if you are not able to remember the whole uh, uh, form at least try to remember the short form of the scheme the pm mitra scheme and which statement is correct is something you have to tell first statement says pm mitra introduced in 2011 12 uh, 20, 21 22 budget yes the scheme is received allocation of 200 crores that is fine initially the budget was more later on it was squeezed so first statement is correct the scheme aims to set up seven mega parks world class infrastructure facilities for textile absolutely correct see it is an integrated textile na integrated what is the meaning of integrated integrated textile parks is basically where every every process of textile can be done in single under the single roof right from spinning to weaving understood to the fiber making then to manufacturing everything can be done under one single roof that is why we have these mega parks so a textile par mega park means everything is to be done at the same place and that's why world class infrastructure is required that's fine that's correct the third statement says the scheme will provide financial support in the form of developmental uh, uh, capital support competitive incentive prices yes special purpose vehicle and unit park third is also correct that is also uh, one of the component of the pradhan mantra mitra scheme now be careful with the fourth statement guys be very very careful with the fourth statement which says the scheme being implemented by the ministry of commerce no it is not very always be careful about the ministries which are being given pradhan mantri mitra scheme is not a product of ministry of commerce it is done by ministry of textiles ministry of textiles so fourth is wrong so you can eliminate every option having four as an answer and just by eliminating the four you will get the right answer as b because remaining all are absolutely correct now since all other statements are correct i still want you to focus on statement number 5 statement 5 says that in this particular scheme there would be capital support for greenfield and brownfield mitra park now these two words are important guys 
what is a green field green field projects are basically those projects which which are absolutely new projects new projects which are being done on the unused land which are being constructed on the unused land like absolutely from scratch you start from scratch you scratch you start from zero and you make the whole project on the unused land now the second term is brownfield brownfield is what brownfield projects are basically the existing one something that already exist now you are just upgrading it you just upgrade that particular project is what called brownfield okay this is extra information so try to use that information for your exam answer has to be b okay ji chalo i hope you are enjoying so far if you are enjoying so far do not forget to give us a like i hope uh, you are enjoying these questions you are learning a lot from these questions so do make sure that you are going to give us a like here and one more important point within this uh, pm matra scheme so basically the support that government gives is by these uh, viability gap funding okay there is a very important term that you should be aware of so even in the pm mitra scheme the all these green field brown field all the capital support that government is giving is support in the form of the viable gap funding now this particular term not necessarily you will find only in this scheme viability gap funding funding is something which you will find in every government scheme so if let's say this is this is just an extra information so let's say if you have any question on viability gap funding now please understand what viability gap funding is all about vgf and why it is so important guys vgf is a financial tool basically like if say government wants to develop an airport okay let's say government says okay i want to develop an airport and for that government says okay i want private companies to come and invest in in it and private in, uh, companies says okay uh, we are not that interested in the airport you know there is so much cost involved we have to invest let's say 100 rupees we have to invest and we are not sure if we are able to recover the cost uh, we are we are doubtful you know the cost we can recover is maximum 70 to 80 so there would be a loss so I, we don't we do not want to invest in such product products so the, this is for private player this should be called as a financially unattractive project and private companies do not do anything which is financially unattractive now but to still to bridge that financial gap the government would say okay don't worry the remaining cost i will bear you don't have to worry about that and that is to be done by vgf vgf is actually a bridge that can uh, it's a financial tool that will bridge the financial gap what is the total cost of the project and what is the final revenue we are expecting any gap in that is to be borne by the government and government under the vgf how government uh, does that government basically support them government basically support the private players maybe by giving some grants my by maybe by giving some kind of subsidies to reduce the cost for the private players or they can give them some incentives kind of thing but ultimately th those kind of projects which are strategically very important for the government strategically very very important for the government government make sure that the projects are to be done even if they have to provide some subsidy or support for that purpose vgf is used as a financial tool i mean you may get a question separately on the vgf also okay it is important that's why i discuss this topic guys now the next one is question number 12 now question number 12 says question number 12 says which one of the following is not a prerequisite again very careful the question is about which is not a prerequisite for internal internalization of the rupee what do you mean by the term internationalization of the rupee first you need to understand well guys as of now rupee is the currency of india okay and rupee is uh, used within india not like you you can't go to the us and use rupee right or you can't use rupee at a global level internationalization of any currency internationalization of the currency means when you are in a position to do the export import and use that and uh, do that in the local currency when you are able to use your local currency for example rupee you are able to do that in global import export i mean whatever you are importing you are paying them in rupee whatever you are exporting you are receiving the payment into rupee 
so if you are able to use or you are able to uh, make your partners or trade partners believe that your currency is very strong currency and if you are your currency is being used at a global level for trade export import that is what you call as internationalization of the rupee similarly a very good example you can see is of the us dollar right us dollar is is acceptable everywhere isn't it so a us dollar you can go to any country you can you can use a dollar there is absolutely no problem so internationalization of the rupee means when we are going to make sure that indian rupee is used for international transactions without any uh, restriction now for that which of the following is not a prerequisite i mean which of them is not required for internationalization of the rupee for example the first statement first says full convertibility of the rupee on the capital account yes this is required i mean i mean all the all the other uh, you know global partners they want a full convertibility of the of their currencies full convertibility is always going to attract your partners and there is a risk also involved when you make your currency full con fully convertible to any currency there is always a risk of you know uh, kind of exposure that you are going to give to your economy and due to any global factor your economy is going to get the hit first so full convertibility is not very good in terms of financial stability of the country but if you want to internationalize your currency full convert convertibility is required currently at present india is having a partial convertibility we are not going with the full convertibility so far but that is required high stable economic growth absolutely absolutely your if you want your currency to be internationalized you make sure there is high and stable economic growth that you are having then only the demand of your currency increase no this is ultimately going to increase the demand of your currency why us why usa is able to uh, become a global power because of because of its economy because of the high stable growth that used to be there in the usa that's why its currency is, has become such a credible currency that is also required third is deep and liquid domestic financial market absolutely yes the deep and liquid domestic market will make sure there is enough availability of the rupee and you are able to you know you know use it at its full potential third is absolutely correct fourth is not correct fourth is not a prerequisite for internationalization of the rupee because it says membership of the sdr basket guys sdr what is sdr sdr special drawing right is basically it is an asset which is prepared by imf international monetary fund it is all together a different thing the special drawing right sdr has nothing to do with internationalization of the rupee now of course you may be asked this question what exactly is sdr it's a separate thing so try to prepare something special about sdr i'll i'll talk that in detail but please make sure you understand the first three are important for internationalization the fourth is not fourth is not even relatable fourth is altogether a different phenomena now first let me tell you about the oh, this sdr this is important for you to understand what is a special drawing right special drawing right is a international reserve asset which is created by international monetary fund imf why it is being created it is being created to supplement its member countries all the member of imf if there is there is any uh, uh, you know any uh, any situation any situation where uh, where the member countries need support of the imf where they where there is a requirement for uh, for for supplementing their reserves then only the sdr is being used okay now this whole sdr which is international reserve asset it is actually it's it's it is actually based on the basket of five currencies the five global currencies which is the us dollar euro chinese yuan japanese yen and british pound these are the five most accepted global currencies and based on these five currency we prepare a basket and accordingly accordingly we give support to our uh, to our what you say as the member countries now though sdr is not important for internationalization of the rupee but let me tell you one interesting thing guys whenever you calculate the forex of a country whenever you calculate the forex of a country which includes the total gold of the country include the, all the all the global currencies that we have now in that calculation in that calculation 
even SDR is ca calculated. So is SDR part of our Forex? Yes. So whatever SDR India has in IMF, whatever quota, whatever we have our share, that is counted in the, in the calculation of a Forex. That is different. But definitely not a prerequisite for internationalization of the rupee. I hope you guys are clear. So do remember SDR as a component of Forex, but not a prerequisite of the internationalization of the rupee. Now going forward guys, going with the question number 13. The question 13 was about the SEBI. SEBI is the Securities and Exchange Board of India. Very, very important body. It is the one which is taking care of all the stock markets. It is the one that take care that there is no, absolutely no fraud in the stock market. Okay. And SEBI, SEBI was in news recently after the uh, Gotham Adani, uh, you know, that controversy happened uh, after the Hindenburg report. The, Go the Gotham Andani and Hindenburg report. After that, SEBI was very much in the news. SEBI was, in fact, there was an inquiry on SEBI. And SEBI was asked if you have done enough internal uh, inquiry on the Adani stocks or not. So SEBI was very much in the news. So do expect one question on SEBI, guys. Now again, you are supposed to figure out how many statements are the correct one. The first statement says it is, it is a quasi-legislative and quasi-judicial body. Yes, it's a quasi-legislative, quasi-judicial body. It can draft regulations, conduct inquiries, pass the ruling, impose penalties. It has the same power as the civil court. Absolutely right. SEBI is basically a regulatory body for the stock market. It has powers of a civil court, where a, a SEBI can actually conduct inquiry, make some regulations, pass the ruling and even impose penalties. And because of these power, it is called quasi-legislative, quasi-judicial. Quasi-judicial, what is quasi is basically partial. There is one thing called judicial body. Judicial body, judicial has all, all kind of power. Judicial body has all the powers in terms of making uh, any law, I mean uh, implementing any law. So judicial having both criminal as well as civil, both powers, right? Now here, SEBI does not have a criminal power. It has only power of a civil court. That's why the word is quasi, that is partial. That is uh, correct. The second statement says, the Security Appellate Tribunal is a statutory body established under the SEBI Act 1992. It is also correct. Now, one thing I want you guys to know. SEBI was actually established in 1988. Okay. That time it was, it was not a statutory body. What is a statutory body? Statutory body is something which is established under any particular act of parliament. Any organization, any body which is being established under the provision of any act of parliament that is called statutory. Okay. Initially, SEBI was not statutory. It was later 1992 when the SEBI act was passed and SEBI was given the statutory body status. At the same time, security appellate tribunal, appellate tribunal is where, where the people can complain if there is any kind of irregularities. So people can complain and those complaints will be settled in the appellate tribunal. This is the judicial part of uh, SEBI. So that also got the statutory status. So first and second are correct. The third statement says, these security appellate tribunal hear and disposes appeals against the order passed by the uh, PFRDA, the IRD and SEBI. Yes, that's, that's correct. So this particular, sep uh, the, now very interesting. Though this security appellate tribunal, it is uh, established under the SEBI Act only, but if required, this one particular tribunal is also responsible for hearing the complaints. If there is any complaint with respect to PFRDA, which is Pension Fund Regulatory Development Authority. Even the cases of the PFRD is also being settled by it. Yes, that is correct. Even the cases of uh, IRDAI, which is Insurance Regulatory Development Authority of India. And of course, SEBI is definitely there because it is under the SEBI. So all the cases from three different regulatory bodies are settled by one only security appellate tribunal. That is correct. So which is the answer? The answer has to be all three. 1, 2, 3, all are absolutely correct. Now, I told you the context, why SEBI is important and why you should prepare SEBI. That is again very, very important, guys. Question 14. 
is something to do with the stock market so be very careful question number 14 was about the stock exchanges and you were supposed to find which statement is the correct one first statement very simple very simple statement what is a stock exchange it's a marketplace where securities like stock bonds are bought and sold yes absolutely correct Bombay Stock Exchange is the oldest stock exchange in Asia. Yes, it is. It, it was established in 1875. It is one of the oldest, not the one. It is actually the oldest stock exchange of the Asia, established 1875. And the first stock exchange in India to obtain permanent recognition, yes, in 1956. So first and second are absolutely correct, no problem. The third statement has something wrong. What is wrong, guys? It says that stock exchange has two different, has different, different benchmark. For example, there is one benchmark indices called the National Stock Exchange has Sensex and BSC has Nifty. I mean, this is totally wrong. You, I'm sure it's a very simple one. You, you guys know that. We have the two stock exchanges, the Bombay Stock Exchange, BSC is Bombay Stock Exchange. And then we have the National Stock Exchange. BSC has, has one indicator, one indices, which, which uses Sensex. Sensex is basically... It's a collective, it's a group of 30 largest share. The 30 largest share on the Bombay Stock Exchange that is actively sold or bought. So the 30 most largest share are combined and compiled as one Sensex. It is, what is, what is this uh, 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 benchmark ind indices do? It actually tell you the mood of the market. It actually can tell you how the market is behaving. So see, there are, there are thousands and thousands of the companies, right? On any stock exchange, there are thousands and thousands of the company. If you have to understand the overall performance of the market, you can't go and read every 1000 companies, right? So basically, it's a, uh, we, what we always refer is Sensex. We look at the Sensex. So that is basically compilation of the 30 largest share. If the whole sex, Sensex is positive, means the market sentiment is positive. If it goes down, if it is negative, means the whole market is going down. Uh, whenever the market is going down, it is always called the, uh, it is always called the bear economy. And if the market is going in a positive manner, it's called the bull economy. Bull is when you are seeing the prices of share going high, that is called bull. And bear is the prices are going down, okay? Now, similarly, the Na National Stock Exchange has its own index, which is called Nifty. Nifty has a short name called Nifty 50. We always call it as Nifty 50. Why Nifty 50? Because Nifty is the combined compilation of the 50 stock, most traded 50 stocks, most liquid stocks, which are in a high, uh, you know, purchase and sale. So here, the question is, third statement is wrong because National Stock Exchange has Nifty and BSC has Sensex as, as its index, okay? So third is wrong. Answer has to be uh, B, that is one and two. Now, now we have the next one. So question number 15, very again important question, question number 15. Now this question is about the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development called OECD. So OECD, Inclusive framework on global minimum tax. Recently, it was very much in the news. It was very much in the news because the global minimum tax is something which is always talked about. I mean, last year it was very much asked the OECD global minimum tax. Now, the question says, with respect to this global minimum tax, which of the following statement best reflect the potential impact on India's public finances and economic development? Now, before I explain you which of the four is correct with respect to India, you need to understand what is a global minimum tax. It's a very important topic of economy that you guys need to understand. So guys, what happens basically, especially in case of multinational companies, the MNCs, the multinational companies, they have their branches all over the world. They have their offices, they have their subsidiaries all over the world, right? That's why the name is multinational. They have offices in many nationalities, many countries. Normally what they do, so as per the standard norm, the multinational corporations, they, of course, they have to pay some taxes, right? They have to pay some taxes, whatever they earn, they have to pay some tax to the government. The standard practice says, they pay the taxes not based on their location, 
but based on their profit in which particular location means suppose if there is an MNC which is in India in India let's say we have an office okay or let's say let's I'll give you an example let's say let's give an example of Apple so Apple is a US based firm yes so Apple is uh, the location of the Apple is USA but what Apple does Apple never show the US branch profit what exactly Apple does app whatever Apple earns from the US Apple office they all reinvest to their Ireland subsidy there is another office of Apple in the Ireland let, let's see but getting my point so MNCs are supposed to pay the taxes not on the location where they are based rather they are supposed to pay the taxes on to that particular location where they are making the profit so instead of declaring their profit in the United States because in USA they have a high taxation system they have high tax rates okay so if Apple is earning let's say 100 rupees they will say okay I'm not earning these 100 in USA I'm actually earning these 100 in Ireland because Ireland is a country which is having very low taxes are you getting my point so that is a very tricky thing that MNCs used to do and this particular practice is called BEPS what is BEPS it stands for base erosion and profit sharing it stands for the base erosion and profit profit shifting so that is that's how they share shift their uh, profit and why did do, do that of course this is called the tax this is called the tax uh, uh, evasion that is that is what they call as a tax evasion they they simply save their tax by simply shifting their profit to those companies or those countries where there are very negligible taxes and that's how that's how that this particular practice of OECD was hurting all the economies across the world okay it was hurting all the economies now OECD which is organization for economic global cooperation development OECD has come up with a plan to stop this in order to counter to stop this base erosion and profit sharing to stop these kind of tax evasions OECD has come up with a global minimum tax called GMT now GMT says doesn't matter your profits you have to pay 15% of your revenues we do not care about your profits if you are you should not uh, hide your profits you have to pay minimum 15% tax you have to pay doesn't matter if you are making profit or not that is what we are being said now the question is about how this particular tax is going to impact Indian Indian finances okay I hope that that part is clear first statement says this is part a it says the GMT will primarily benefit developed countries yes it will benefit developed countries more that is absolutely correct but India also gains negligible revenue due to limited presence in it oh, no this is not correct see India definitely as, as you compare India and developed economies definitely developed economies are going to gain more from that but over a period of time even India has is going to gain a lot in the long term it's not that India is going to lose something India is also going to get more additional revenue because there are so many MNCs which are in India so India is also going to generate extra additional revenue will be there for India so first statement is wrong it is not the case with India Second statement says the 15% the minimum tax could disincentivize the FDI in India on a large scale hindering infrastructure development also that is not the case I mean I uh, I mean there is a there are chances that if India will start implementing this 15% tax obviously some companies do not want to come to India then of course there will be some impact but you see it is not going to completely disincentivize FDI FDI is a FDI is something which is which depends on many factor guys I mean today India is a country which is one of the leading FDI recipients of the world today India is the country receiving the maximum FDI from foreign investors why there are a lot of factors look at the cheap labor that is available in India we have the cheap labor and we have the best skilled labor also we are we have a quality labor also the business laws in India is are qu quite favorable so it's not that only by implementing one tax the FDI will go away that is not going to happen so second is also 
not that true so first second not correct third statement says that india's digital economy stands to benefit significantly from gmt which target untaxed profits of multinational tech giants yes that is actually the case that is actually the case in fact india's digital economy will get the be maximum benefit because right now india's digital economy is continuously expanding and all these multinational tech giants like like there is something called as gafa techs i hope you have heard of the gafa techs which is google amazon uh, facebook apple which is called gafa techs so all these multinational tech giants who still have untaxed profits india will be able to tax the profits of these big companies like google apple amazon flipkart uh, uh, i mean uh, facebook right so india is actually going to gain a lot from this particular tax so third statement is what what is has to be right when it comes to the fourth statement gmt required complex administration potential steering india's tax authorities that is not the case india is a well a well economically structured country and uh, india will surely figure out the administrative things and all that's not that uh, india already uh, is dealing with lot of complicated tax system yaar india already has uh, one of the complex uh, uh, tax systems in the world so we are already dealing a lot so we will we will be in a position to surely take care of that okay that's not an issue at all okay so now going by the question number 16 so i hope that answer is correct to everyone that is clear so question number 15 should be answer c that is 3 okay uh in the pdf you can always download i am going to explain everything but uh, you can later if you want to read more about these topics then of course you can simply download the pdf and you can read them uh, later guys now question number 16 what the question number 16 says question number 16 was about the digital india land record modernization program which is called dil rmp what this particular scheme is all about digital india land record Man modernization program the first statement says it is central sector scheme aimed to computerize land record survey computerization yes absolutely what is a central sector scheme guys by the way important there are two type of government scheme one is called the central sector scheme central sector schemes are those which are 100% funded by the government of india the union government 100% funding will come from the central government another kind of scheme is called the central sponsored scheme when you go with central sponsored scheme that means the funding will be shared the funding would be shared between center and the states okay that is called central sponsored and central sector is 100% by the government so first is absolutely correct second statement says launched in 2000 this scheme was launched in 2016 it was done by revamping yes there were already some existing national record modernization program it was already there in 2016 uh, we got this new scheme where all the uh, the previous schemes were uh, revamped it they were merged and they were uh, given new names so second is also correct before 2016 we used to have national record land record modernization program a uh, third statement says it will integrate the land record database with aadhar tax record other databases of course of course it will it will do that and why this scheme is so important because once it will create a digital databases of all the lands of india it will uh, definitely improve the transparency and reduce the litigation there will be less land disputes because once you have computerized records of the land you people don't have to really fight with each other so all three are correct that's why answer has to be four all of the above so question number 16 has to be d which is four here uh, which is a misprinting has to be d it has to be a b c d so fourth is the right one you can you can call it a fourth uh, uh, a 16 question answer four or d whatever is there so the last one is absolutely correct guys going further with our next question which is question number 17 now this is a very important question guys question 17 is about which statement is correct about india's nuclear program okay so this again you take it as a b c and d not 1 2 3 4 has to be a b c d now question number 17 says uh question number 17 says it is uh, this uh, nuclear power program is based on india's nuclear power program is based on three stage strategy to utilize the uranium and thorium reserves in the country it is absolutely correct before i discuss any of this 
प्लीज अंडरस्टैंड वट इज इंडियाज न्यूक्लियर प्रोग्राम एंड वट इज दिस थ्री स्टेट स्ट्रैटेजी नॉर्मली गाइज फॉर एनी न्यूक्लियर प्रोग्राम वट डू यू नीड फॉर एनी न्यूक्लियर प्रोग्राम बाय द वे न्यूक्लियर प्रोग्राम इज फॉर फॉर पीसफुल यूज ऑफ न्यूक्लियर एनर्जी राइट इट इज अबाउट द पीसफुल यूज ऑफ न्यूक्लियर एनर्जी एंड इन न्यूक्लियर प्रोग्राम्स आर बेस्ड ऑन यूरेनियम टू थर्टी फाइव यूरेनियम टू थर्टी फाइव इज द रेडियो एक्टिव इट इज द रेडियो एक्टिव मटीरियल एंड वी डू द न्यूक्लियर फिशन रिएक्शन वंस दिस न्यूक्लियर यू थर्टी फाइव इट इज द न्यूक्लियर फिशन रिएक्शन द चेन रिएक्शन एंड देन वी गेट द रिक्वायर्ड अमाउंट ऑफ एनर्जी आई मीन दिस इज अ नॉर्मल सिंपल कॉन्सेप्ट बट प्लीज डू रिमेंबर द होल प्रोग्राम इज अबाउट यू थर्टी फाइव देर इज अ प्रॉब्लम विद यू थर्टी फाइव गाइज इन नेचर वी हैव यूरेनियम टू थर्टी एट टू यूरेनियम टू थर्टी एट इज द नेचुरल यूरेनियम दैट यू गेट नाइंटी नाइन परसेंट ऑफ द यूरेनियम विच इज प्रेजेंट ऑन दिस प्लान अर्थ is uranium 238 which is a natural one is it's a stable one it does not react it has nothing to do with the nuclear program so what many countries uh, what many countries do is basically they take u35 they they do the, they do the enrichment of this they do the enrichment of this and then they make uranium 235 naturally uranium 235 is present but that is that is somewhere 0.7% only remaining 0.3% is uranium 234 that is of no use for any of us as of now so 235 naturally is very less so obviously this 0.7 is not going to fulfill the energy required uh, requirements of the whole world right so uranium 235 uh, is something we create we do create it by the process called enrichment but for that you need to have a very high skill technology and every that i mean india obviously no country no developed country gave india its technology india's entire nuclear program is by our own efforts okay if india would have got this enrichment technique we can simply we could have enriched u35 to 235 uh, 38 to 235 but that was not the case so india had to rely on its own sources and this process which looks so simple now it was not available with india india started its nuclear program way back in 1950s 1960s right so that time india designed our nuclear program as a three stage strategy what exactly we are doing what we are doing right now so we have uranium 238 uh, is something we have okay so once you have 238 what we do uranium 238 using the using the nuclear reactions we convert in our first stage in our first stage we put this uranium 235 into a pressurized reactors we put them into the pressurized reactors and as a process of this pressurized reaction we produce plutonium we are able to produce the plutonium okay we get the plutonium plutonium is p239 is the end product now in the second stage of our nuclear program we we use this p239 as a fuel now this is used as a fuel and we put that 239 into fast breeder another kind very special type of nuclear reactor called fast breeder nuclear reactor fast breeder nuclear reactor means it produces more fuel than it consumes that is the word that's why the word is fast breeder it consume less fuel produces more now as a process of this uh, 239 plutonium 239 it gets converted into some uranium 233 we convert that into uranium 233 not 235 233 and in the third stage in the third stage we are using 233 we are we are producing u33 and third stage we are using thorium as our fuel now th india has thorium in abundance india does not have uranium much but india has thorium reserves india in fact has one of the largest thorium reserves and that is there in the monazite sand 
thorium we have in the monazite sand that was asked in UPSC 2022 also. If you go to UPSC 2022 paper, there was a question asked on the thorium and the monazite sand that is there in Kerala. In Kerala, you have huge thorium reserves. So that this is called a three stage nuclear process. India has made its own nuclear process in such a way. Okay, so first statement is absolutely correct. India has our three stage strategy based on uranium and thorium and also the plutonium that is correct. Second statement is also correct. It says Department of Atomic Energy aims to achieve 20 gigawatt capacity by 2030. Yes, that is the aim we are aiming for. India received international cooperation technology transfer from many countries. Yes, that is also correct. But that happened very late. I mean, this international cooperation started in 2008, all thanks to Manmohan Singh. Dr. Manmohan Singh cracked India-US nuclear civil deal. Remember, Indo-US nuclear civil deal. This was a deal which was signed in 2008. Only after this, only because of Dr. Manmohan Singh's effort, after the success of this nuclear civil deal, we were, we were given, in 2009, we were given waiver. We were given exception, waiver from the nuclear supplier group, NSG. NSG, nuclear supplier group, is the group of countries that produces and export uranium. Now, only after this, India was able to get the uranium from other countries like Australia, Russia, France, Kazakhstan, all these countries. Got it? NSG is important. India is not a member of NSG, by the way. India is not a member of NSG. Just to give you more information, India is not member of nuclear supplier group. India is continuously pushing for it. But so far, India is not a member of NSG. Because to become a member of NSG, there are certain more requirements. You, you also have to sign a treaty called as Comprehensive Ban uh, CTBT Treaty. You have to sign this treaty which says you will never ever use or test any nuclear weapon. And because India uh, strategically is between China and Pakistan, we can't really sign and assure that India will never use or we, we will never test any nuclear weapon because there is always a China and Pakistan threat. So India has not signed CTBT. That's why India is not a member so far. So in this case, I can see all the three are absolutely correct. So answer has to be D. Okay, you can call it D also. You can call it as four. So 17 has to be D. I think this is also clear to everyone. This statement is also clear. Now moving ahead, moving with the uh, question number 18. The question 18 is about the AFSPA Act, which is Armed Forces Special Power Act AFSPA. Now, how many statements are correct, it is says. So, AFSPA enacted 1958, yes, to grant special power to the armed forces in certain areas of the country. Yes, absolutely correct. Just to give you information, guys, the original AFSA, AFSPA was actually made by Britishers. It was 1942 that quit India movement. When Britishers gave special power to their armed personnel, armed forces to crush the Quit India movement. That is where the first time AFSPA was made by the Britishers. After independence, uh, our Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru retained this Special Power Act and it was enacted in 1958 as per Indian requirement. It, what is this act? This is a very serious act by the way and there is a lot of controversies also about the Armed Force Special Power Act. Now, it empowered the armed forces. They can arrest, search, use force against any person, any property in any disturbed area. If there is any dis disturbed area can be like any area which is not having proper law and order, any area having any kind of clashes based on religion, community or any kind of disturbances there. If there is, there is no proper law and order, armed forces can come there and they can, using their armed forces special power act, they can use force even if they have to kill somebody they can shoot also of course the sh they can't shoot without uh, giving them warning there is a process even if you have to shoot someone you first have to give a warning then only you can shoot but because it's an armed forces special power act every single army personnel using this power will get a legal immunity to be to them for their actions they have done in the disturbed area you know for many many reasons uh, Jammu Kashmir used to have this AFSPA. In India, the, the actual use of AFSPA was first done in the northeastern state. It was the northeastern states of India where the AFSPA was first implemented. 
you know, uh, in many in many northeastern uh, states we still have some states we still have afspa, and now it is mainly used in Jammu and Kashmir. Okay, against to crush the terror activities. Okay, now the fourth statement says the area can be declared disturbed by the central government. Yes, the central government can declare any area as disturbed area. Even the state government can declare the area as uh, as disturbed. And now, as in case of Jammu Kashmir, the area can also be declared as disturbed by even the UT administrator. Even the Union Territories administrator, they can also declare. So, which area is disturbed can be decided by center as well as state as well as by Union Territory. So, all four are absolutely correct. Answer has to be four. I think this is clear to everyone. There is no doubt in that the, the answer has to be this. Now, question number 19. Question number 19 is about the open market sale scheme OMSS. Now, it's a scheme implemented by Food Corporation of India to sell the surplus food grains from central pool in the open market. Yes, absolutely correct. Now, please, before I take you to the second statement, understand what is FCI. The Food Corporation of India, which was established in 1960s, was done was established because because there was a food shortage in India at that time right remember it was 1960s when India was not it was not a very food surplus country India was always having issues in terms of the food security and that was a time the green revolution took place in India and after the green revolution changed the landscape of India forever and we have become food surplus country we have become the food surplus country after green revolution then the food corporation of india was established so that any surplus food can be stored with the fci now the food corporation of india which 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 works under the ministry of uh, uh, this thing uh, ministry of consumer and food protection now the fci the food corporation of india has a mandate that they have to buy they have to buy if you know if if any if any farmer is going to sell any uh, crop at the MSP, it is the Food Corporation of India that has to buy that particular, uh, you know, particular crop. So it the Food Corporation of Corporation of India, you know, get all the food from all over the country, and they always have a surplus. They always store the food. Later on, that is their job that they have to sell that particular food grains into the open market and they that they do using the open market scale, uh, sale scheme okay now why they do that there are two objectives one they have to sell it and secondly by when the food corporation of india when they sell the uh, food grains to the market they also maintain the prices they, their job is also to maintain the prices of the food grains understood not just selling selling is one part also to maintain the prices of the food grains that is their second job. The first statement is correct. There is now the second statement is not correct, guys. Why is the second is not correct? Second statement says the states are allowed to procure additional food grains. Now that has been stopped. Now, now this second statement is wrong because after the COVID, guys, after the COVID, you know, our uh, our government of India is feeding 80 crore people. Yes or no? 80 crore people are given free food grains. They are given free food grains, 80 crore people, under the Pradhan Mantri Garib Kalyan An Yojana. Yes. Now, because government is feeding 80 crore people free food grains, that's why now states are not included. States are rather excluded from these open market sales schemes. So say states are not allowed because the government has stopped giving states the food from this uh, from this way because government wants to ensure food for these 80 crore people. So that's why second statement is incorrect. It is answer has to be A. The first statement is only correct. Now going by the statement which is uh, the question number 20 sorry the question number 20. Now that's a very important question about artificial intelligence, which is again the top of the topic. And I would highly recommend you to prepare this topic. It's a, it's a very hot topic for your upcoming UPSC prelims, also for the mains, but also for the prelims guys, okay? So AI is a topic that you, you must, must prepare. It's a very, very important topic. And uh, UPSC is very fond of these kind of hot topics. They, they can ask you the question on that. <coughs> the first statement says, now you have to find out which statement is correct. The first statement says, 
द ग्लोबल पार्टनरशिप ऑन ए आई इज अ मल्टी स्टेक होल्डर इनिशिएटिव दैट एक्चुअली एम्स टू ब्रिज द गैप बिटवीन द थ्योरी एंड प्रैक्टिस ऑन द ए आई बाय सपोर्टिंग द ग्लो कटिंग एज रिसर्च एंड अप्लाइड एक्टिविटीज ऑन ए आई येस ग्लोबल पार्टनरशिप ऑफ ए आई विच इज कॉल्ड जी पी आई इज अ मल्टी स्टेक होल्डर अप्रोच दैट इज फाइन एंड द सेकेंड स्टेटमेंट इज ऑल्सो करेक्ट विच सेज इंडिया ए आई इट्स अ नेशनल आर्टिफिशियल इंटेलिजेंस पोर्टल येस इन टू थाउजेंड ट्वेंटी इंडिया लॉन्च इंडिया ए आई इंडिया ए आई इज एक्चुअली कलाबोरेशन बिटवीन इंडिया इंडियन गवर्नमेंट प्लस में मेटा इंडिया मेटा इंडिया इज बेसिकली इट्स अ सब्सिडरी ऑफ फेसबुक सो फेसबुक एंड गवर्नमेंट ऑफ इंडिया हैज डन अ मेमोरेंडम ऑफ अंडरस्टैंडिंग दे हैव साइन एन एम ओ यू एंड दे हैव एस्टैब्लिश दिस इंडिया ए आई सो दैट इन इंडिया देर कैन बी प्रॉपर डेवलपमेंट ऑफ द ए आई टेक्नोलॉजी सो बोथ स्टेटमेंट्स आर करेक्ट आंसर हैज टू बी सी वन एंड टू बोथ आर करेक्ट जस्ट टू गिव यू बिट मोर इन्फॉर्मेशन प्लीज रिमेंबर एंड प्लीज रीड अबाउट द ग्लोबल पार्टनरशिप इन आर्टिफिशियल इंटेलिजेंस नाउ दिस इज अ मल्टी स्टेक होल्डर इनिशिएटिव मल्टी स्टेक होल्डर देर आर मोर देन टू थ्री पार्टीज विच आर एक्चुअली कॉन्ट्रीब्यूटिंग टू दिस एंड दिस पर्टिकुलर यू नो ग्लोबल पार्टनरशिप ऑन द ए आई is basically so right now ai is a very uh, it's a very new technology it's a naive technology and there is is still a lot of gap between theory and practice because in theory we have we have made lots of theory on the ai but how exactly we are using is still something we have to figure out like for example a uh, simple ai is what we are already we have we have properly developed like your face recognition technologies and all that feature simple okay now we are developing the generative ai generative ai is the next ai which we are which we are developing it is still in the uh, in the processing stage generative ai is where we are going to create smart machines smart machines which can which can perform like human brain kind of activities and that's why because ai is something which has which is a global phenomena everywhere it is happening that's why there is a global partnership to regulate and to see and to support the research and let's see how it applies to the home whole hum, humanity right that's why there is a global uh, partnership now one more thing about uh, india ai that i told you it's a uh, it, it's it's a collaboration between meta india and the government of india from government of india it is uh, ministry of electronics and it which is called maiti in india it is ministry of electronics and technology maiti is the one which is the nodal agency for uh, this national artificial intelligence portal of india which is india ai okay that is again important guys now moving ahead with your next question question number 21 was about the uh, phage therapy this 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 has to be pronounced as phage okay now this was about the phage therapy which statement is correct first statement says in a phage therapy the bacteriophages are used to treat the pathogenic viral infections first statement is not correct guys in phage therapy by the way what is a phage therapy phage therapy as is seen it is seen as an alternative to antibiotics okay it is considered to be as an alternative to the antibiotics it is an alternative to antibiotics and that is why that's why the bacteriophages are used to treat pathogenic not viral infection but the bacterial infections so first is not correct here second statement says the bacteriophage which is uh, also called as phage it's a bacterium that infect the virus no it is not the case what is a bacteriophage in phage in phage therapy basically we have a virus it is the virus that actually infect a bacteria it is not the other way around the question says bacteria affecting virus no it is the virus that affect the bacteria and affecting the bacteria that virus reproduces itself within the bacteria and that is how the phage therapy works where we are able to kill maximum number of bacteria you see like this is an alternative to antibiotics we want to kill the bacteria so in phage therapy there we have a virus and this virus has a special protein coating very specially protein coating is used this virus enters and infects the bacteria reproduces inside it and automatically kill that bacteria that's why phage therapy is considered to be as 
alternative to the antibiotics so both are incorrect answer has to be d i know this is a new concept it was a bit hard but uh, i hope you are you guys are clear now what this phage therapy is all about if you want to read more you can refer to the pdf and you can read more about it question number 22 again a very straightforward question it says world investment report published by which of the following so world investment report is published by united nation conference on trade and development also popular, popularly called as unctad now this is the organization which is responsible for publishing the world investment report it's a very important report guys it it works as a benchmark for many global trade practices and when it comes to you should you should uh, uh, you should definitely talk about uncatd what is this uncatd it's an international organization and it is a part of un secretariat within un secretariat uncatd works established 1964 by unga which is un general assembly and uh, it is the one that report to that body and the united nation economic and social council now recently this particular report was in news because in the last edition this report has has bring out something very important for india this 2023 report said that india and asean are the hot spots of the fdi investment see i we just had a discussion about the fdi i told you that fdi is very much bright in india india, india is one of the uh, most important country receiving the fdi right now so uh, india and asean both are having lot of fdi and this is revealed by this particular report in fact it says 10% fdis has grown in india from last year and 5% has grown from the asean what is asean by the way asean stands for a, uh, for association of southeast asian nation there are 10 countries of southeast asia 10 countries of southeast asia which are which are the member of the asean association of uh, of the southeast asian nations okay that is important and now this particular organization uncat tad is also responsible for many other report not just the world investment report other than this world investment report there is trade and development report economic development in africa report least developed countries which is called the ldc report and digital economy report now please be very careful if we have asked you question about one of the report of uncatd you are also supposed to remember the other four reports you never know upsc may ask you the question from these kind of reports okay so be very uh, very careful whatever you read try to implement that in your exam so do remember the other four reports as well question 23 about the blockchain technology with reference to blockchain technology you are supposed to give us the right answer which statement is the correct one which is the right one so blockchain is distributed ledger technology yes it is record transactions in a secure transparent immutable way absolutely correct so blockchain is what it's a distributed ledger and every transaction is recorded in the form of the blocks right in the form of the blocks there is maintenance of the public record that's why the name is blockchain technology second statement says the distributed ledger is a decentralized shared database synchronized across multiple system location geographies and it is accessible to every participant yes it is absolutely correct that is the benefit of blockchain it is very secure very very secure there is encryption and blockchain is very transparent also because every participant can see the record the public records of transition uh, of the, of the any kind of tra transactions so it's very transparent record and uh, the database is shared across all the links so second is also correct fourth statement is also correct i am skipping the third by the way right now fourth is also correct it says open ai open artificial intelligence has reintroduced world coin world coin is something a cryptocurrency project aims to create a global identify a uh, system on biometric data see world coin is a is a kind of coin that keeps the record of your iris scan yeah like your eye scan your iris scan is being recorded in the world coin it, it's a kind of cryptocurrency and it is also very secure cryptocurrency first one two three are correct but there is problem with the third one the third statement here is not correct what third statement says it says nft non fungible token token is a type of crypto cryptographic token that is so far it is correct but it says it is identical and it is interchangeable no there are two types of token guys electronically 
in digital media digital record there are two types of tokens it can be fungible token it can be non fungible token now non fungible tokens this one they are cryptographic token they they have cryptography in them but the unique part is that they are very unique they are not identical every nft is a unique nft and they are non interchangeable they are non interchangeable you can't interchange them with any other thing that's why they are considered to be very very secure instruments it is the fungible tokens which are identical and interchangeable so there is problem with the third statement so answer has to be only 3 1 2 and 4 are correct not the third one now you must read about the nfts nft is a very very important technology especially in terms of protecting your data if you want to protect your data if you want to protect your content nowadays content creators are using the nfts non fungible tokens uh, as a to as a cryptographic token so that their data is not going to get leaked or that kind of thing hai na okay uh, question number 24 the question number 24 is again very simple question it says the question is about protection of the plant varieties and farmer right 2001 the first statement says this particular act is sui generis system of intellectual property protection for plant varieties that is compatible with trade related aspect which is called trip agreement yes that is correct farmers are eligible for recognition and rewards for conservation of the plant genetic resources that is also correct breeders have exclusive right to produce sell market distribute import yes that's correct all are very factual very factual there is nothing much to explain in this it allows the farmer to save use so exchange share the farm produce under this act everything is fine so answer has to be d all four are correct it was a very simple one it was a direct factual based information if you simply read the scheme you will get to know it there is nothing much to explain here okay now last question is important last question number 25 the last question of this particular part one video question is about the uh, it is about the micro small medium enterprises msmes and you have to figure out which statement is correct so first statement says vivad se vishwas one vivad se vishwas one is a scheme by the way it is a scheme for relief to msmes has been initiated by department of expenditure ministry of finance with aim to provide assistance to the msmes that is absolutely correct by the way let me tell you there are three vivad se vishwas scheme now we be very careful here guys now there is a scheme called vivad se vishwas normal vivad se vishwas it was a scheme the first scheme was actually about to uh, settle the direct tax disputes if there is if there was an any direct tax dispute between the ministry of income between department of income tax and the users like mainly your income tax disputes so first scheme vivad se vishwas was about settling the direct tax disputes then we got this vivad se vishwas 1 now that is about providing relief to the msmes that is the second one very recently last year we got vivad se vishwas 2.0 there is another vivad se vishwas 2.0 now that is about settling the uh, um, you know agreement dispute any kind of there is any kind of contract dispute it is about settling the contract dispute if there is any co uh, government agreement government contract that dispute is there it is to settle that so be very careful which vivad se vishwas is being asked okay now this is vivad se vishwas one so yes it is about msmes especially during the covid times uh, many reliefs were given to the micro small medium enterprises that is correct second statement says pradhan mantri mudra yojana which was launched in 2015 there were yeah it says the tarun loan covers the amount 50 lakh to 1 crore no that is not correct that is not correct why 1 uh, crore is not a limit in mudra anyway mudra is a very important it's a micro finance uh, uh, you know uh, program very in innovative program started by government of india so what is this mudra is about so pradhan mantri mudra yojana launched 2015 now it gives a loan up to 10 lakh 1 crore is not a limit the upper limit maximum uh, loan that you can you will be given is 10 lakh rupees so definitely second statement is not correct and who will get this loan the non corporates the non farm small micro enterprises mainly those people 
who are considered to be micro units in mudra yojana the the beneficiaries are those which are defined as micro units micro units are basically those people who do not get the fund or do not get the loan easily and that's why to help to fund the unfunded in mudra there were three types of loans which were distributed one was the shishu loan shishu is a category where you will be given loan up to 50000 rupees that is the maximum limit then uh, other than shishu we have a kishore kishore loan was about somewhere about 50000 to 5 lakh rupees maximum and then we have the third category tarun the which was asked in the question it is maximum 5 lakh to maximum 10 lakh so that is the limit so that's why the third second statement is incorrect so that is all guys i really hope you have enjoyed our first video discussion i really have uh, I'm, I'm very hopeful that you have learned a lot from this video discussion so this was part number one so three more parts will be there and this is how we are going to cover our entire test series so if you have enjoyed if you have learned anything from this do check out the complete test series there is we have a test series of 10 tests and in those 10 particular tests we will be giving you 1000 question and every single mcq is going to be explained by me ashish malik the same way i have done today okay so if you are interested to seriously crack your upsc prelims 2024 i would recommend you guys to check out the test series the link of the test series is there in the description box subscribe to our test series uh, and you will get to know a lot you will learn a lot of things from our test series and they are going to be extremely beneficial for your upcoming exams if you have if you have any doubt if you have anything to say please drop your feedback in the comment section box i am really interested to see your feedbacks how you like this particular video what is your take on that and uh, how useful for it i really want you guys to give me uh, your feedback in the comment section box my name is ashish malik see you guys in the next part part 2 is going to be released tomorrow and again we will do the uh, discussion of the question from 26 to 50 in that particular next video thank you so much all the best for your exam and do check out the test series in the uh, uh, the link given in the description box take care god bless you jai hind